You know something about God? I'll tell you something about God. God is always moving. He's moving in your life and he's moving in my life. His desire is to bring you into the image of Christ. Pray your blessing on each household represented here for health and safety. We pray you'll be with the young people as they're being instructed. And we pray, Lord, that each one of us today, we, we've come to God's house to learn your will for our lives. And Lord, we pray everyone will receive something from Jesus, we pray, to go home with. And we ask that in faith, believing in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to Revelation. We're going to read verses chapter 19 verses 11 through the end of the chapter Revelation chapter 19 verse 11 to the end of the chapter I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the king and the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Now. Uh, this is a true picture of the end of the church age, you may say. After this comes um, uh, the thousand-year kingdom age, and then finally, after that, the new heaven and earth reign of Christ. So it's good to know, as we see our nation spiraling downward in unbelievable sin. There, there are moral sins being committed today throughout the United States and England that we know of, and I'm sure through Scandinavia and other countries, that uh, we begin to think, well, the devil's winning. <laughs> I know that in England, Currently, there are so many teen pregnancies, unwanted pregnancies, that they are 
uh, giving sexual instruction to children five years old and protective devices to 10-year-old children in England. And in America, there are moral um, immorality, moral perversions and sins uh, that 20 years ago, no one would have believed, no one would have believed could take place in the United States. And as we see so much of this, we begin to think, well, it sure looks like this is going to be the norm. The devil is going to win. And so this is why we have the book of Revelation. So we'll know that no matter how great the evil becomes, the Lord is going to put it to an end. In fact, in one place it talks about the peoples of the earth defying all of God's rules. And it doesn't say that God becomes excited or fearful or angry. What does it say he does? He laughs. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. And you say, well, how can that be? It's because he knows it's it's like you were looking down at ants on the ground and there was an ant down there and he and you were coming at him with some ant spray and he kicked out his hind leg and you knew what he was telling you that uh, you weren't going to hurt him. That's and well you'd look at that as eat crazy ant <laughs> in two minutes you'll be meeting your maker because I've got a can of ant spray here. But it would be laughable, not because you enjoy arrogant or prideful ants, but because it's so ridiculous. And so, in the United States, where we begin to prove that there is no God and evolution's true and all the moral laws are so much foolishness, it's just like God looking down at we would look down at ants and say, you're crazy. What, what's the matter with you? Don't you realize that if I can stretch out the heavens that you are no threat to me? But God is loving and he has the world the way he wants it. And by the way, don't fret yourself because of evil. Don't fall into that trap. It's going to be a real spiritual problem for Christians in the months to come and years to come because um, we, we don't, like the fellow said, Cain killed his brother and it ain't right. <laughs> well, there's things that ain't right from the beginning. But when we fret about the Republicans or the Democrats or the budget or Iraq or the Muslims, when we fret, we're showing that we don't have faith in God. Come on. Come on. We're saying God is too bad. that You ought to be able to do better. Or else you don't have the power to do better or whatever. But as it says in the 37th Psalm, fretting leads to sin. And it does. And God wants us to think about the things that are pure the things that are lovely, and to rejoice in the Lord always. And he said this when he was in prison. It's sound mental health, and it's sound spiritual health to just... Uh, this is a, a black preacher, not that I should stress black, but I enjoy it because I think the black brothers sometimes get jobs done that the white brothers don't. And he said, when you see these things, play deaf and dumb. <laughs> play deaf and dumb. Forget it. It's God's problem. If God gives you something to do about it, then do about it. But don't fret because the Bible says that 
it leads to evil and it does it destroys our pure relationship with the Lord and we're telling the father he doesn't know what he's doing God knows the sparrow on the branch he knows everything how many believe that a few he can change anything at any time that he wants how many believe that well, a few more <laughs> How many believe he, he knows what he's doing and he's doing the best there is? Amen. Even more. Well, we're going in the right direction. There was, some of you get the prophetic uh, bulletin that Andrew Strom sets out. How many get that on their uh, internet? A couple of people. Well, it's usually got some pretty stuff, good stuff on there. And people write in with their personal prophecies. And they're all good. Everyone I read is good. And a lady came out with a vision. It was in the Andrew Strom's newsletter about two days ago of a protracted vision that she had. In fact, Bob Taylor's wife, Marilyn, wrote to me and asked me what I thought of it. Well, I guess this went on throughout the lady's day as she worked in her house. If I got it straight, and it kept coming back and more would be added more would be added and basically what she said was that things are going that the lion has roared and as a result things are going to change everything's going to change the poor are going to become rich the the starving are going to be fed and those who are fed are going to be starving everything that we know the institutions the governments everything shall be changed a very radical statement but in there and this was repeated a few times she said that the light the light is going to move from the west to the east now, I don't know how many of you remember, but I'm sure I said this publicly because a few months ago, I was uh, kind of in the spirit and I felt the Lord saying to me that what we are facing in America is a revival in the midst of trouble. Well, I've been saying that for 31 years here. Uh, but he elaborated on it that the revival will be a revival of God's people repenting and turning away from their sins. See, we think of revival in terms of the unsaved. But the Lord is saying what has to be revived is his church. And it's going to be revived in the midst of great trouble. And the Lord went on to say, and I believe it was the Lord, he said, after the spirit of repentance has been lifted, you know, you, repentance is a gift. You may think you can repent anytime you want to. Let me tell you something. Repentance is a gift. That's what it says in Acts, the gift of repentance. And after the spirit of repentance has been lifted and God's work has been done, there will be war in the United States and much blood shall be shed. And then he said, at the end of that time, America will become a third-rate nation and the leadership of the world. And the word for that, and you'll see it in the paper, you need to know it, is hegemony. Everybody say that. Hegemony. Its spell looks like hegemony. But when you see it, it's pronounced hegemony, and it means leadership. And the world hegemony will pass from the United States to an Eastern country. Now, I don't want to add to that. We can speculate about India and Japan and whatever else we want to, uh, China, but he didn't say that. He said to an Eastern nation. Well, I've never heard anyone else say that. Does anybody in here remember my saying that? Yes, yeah, quite a few, because it's on a tape, anyway. And when I saw that, I said, click, go. That's exactly right. The light and the glory of God are going to move from the west to the east because 
the Western nations have been Christian. We were in England not too long ago looking at the various um, large minsters there, and that's what they call their churches, minsters. There's Westminster and all the other minsters and huge things, St. Paul's and the museums and it's all, all Christian. That's what it's all about. The whole history of England is Christian. And it came to this country largely from England and other Western countries. Sweden. Wonderful story. Einar Gislason told me over in Iceland about how one of the warring tribes of Sweden when there's still war with the Danes and the Norsemen and all, came to Christ, the whole tribe in 800 A.D. Well, see, Christianity is strong in uh, the Christian tradition in uh, uh, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, in uh, Italy, England, Germany, France, but they're turning away from it. Like I told you about England. We know what to do about teenage pregnancies. We'll hand out devices to the fifth graders. That's a nation that historically has been a bastion of Christianity. So the times they are changing and God has given his light and his glory to the Western nations. And the East has been full of superstition and false doctrine. And I guess the angel of the Lord, and see these things happen slowly, when it pass from the West to the East. And the East then will have world hegemony. And so, you need to be aware of this. It's a true vision, I believe. And it's nothing to be afraid of. Thank God. I, uh, when I think of such things in England and such things as has been going on in Wisconsin lately and other states uh, in our union, I'd say, God, anything to change this, anything to stop the abortion, anything to change this destruction, of young people in the public schools. Well, that's how I feel about it. I don't want a business as usual to continue. And I tell you, the Democrats and Republicans arrest good men, bad men, whatever they may be, they're not going to change a thing. The lion has roared and change is coming. And so we see in Revelation 19 the words of him who is faithful and true. Uh, adjectives, virtues that are in short supply in our day. Faithfulness and truth. And he says, this is what's going to happen. Heaven's going to open. And a white horse with justice he will judge and make war justice justice hear me back there one of our young people had to write an essay on justice justice is what is needed his name is the word God has impressed that on me in the last Three or four months, I guess, you probably heard me muttering about it in my beard that I don't have. Just uh, the word, the word, the word, the word. I get, a, I get concerned about a number of things in the church. And the Lord says, the word, the word, I want the word out. The word, the word, the word. Okay, you got it. And he's helping us with the television and the internet. Some of you may have seen on the back bulletin board, there were Ernie Gray. Remember Ernie and Maria Gray came through about three weeks ago from Maine. So he's got our W-O-R-O-R-G internet address on his um, license plate on his car. And if you look back on the bulletin board, you'll see it there. That's a Oldsmobile in the state of Maine, W-O-R-O-R-G. And he's trying right now, and he's covet your prayers to get us on a 
station up there. So God wants his word out. It's what he wants. Jesus' name is the word. The word of God. So what do we need today? Can you say amen? amen? We need the word. Notice in verse 14 it's plural. Armies. Armies. When the Bible says armies, it means more than one. Well, there are two. And they have to work together. We see that at the Joshua going into Canaan. He was the leader of Israel, but there came another leader there. <laughs> the leader of God's army. And, and uh, we see the word Mahanaim uh, for Paul and his mother in the Hebrew, that's Machanaim, and it means a double camp or two armies. Jacob saw that, saw Mahanaim when he came out of, uh, from uh, Laban. He met the double camp, camp. And anything that works in the kingdom takes two armies. Joshua said, to the captain of the Lord's house. He said, are you for us or for our enemies? Now, what did the captain of the Lord's house say? How did he respond? Neither. Neither. Not for you, Joshua. And I'm not for the Canaanites. Who's he for? Who's the captain of the Lord's host for? The Lord. And so, if we're going to have the help of Michael and his armies, guess what? We have to be doing the Lord's will. A lot was said about that this morning. It was all good. It was all good. You need, we need a balance in this church between that which has its feet on the ground and that which has its head in the heavens. <laughs> That's a healthy balance, and it's good, and I rejoice to see the missionary work in the bulletin board with, uh, with the, uh, all the black people, and it's wonderful. Um, it's a good balance. But God is not interested in our going out and having a big parade to show how great we are. He wants us to find out what his will is and do it. How many believe that? When we do, there'll be another army with us. But until we do, we're punching a bag with marshmallows in it. We're going nowhere and we can make all the noise and raise all the money and propaganda and magazine articles and everything that you want to name and that won't amount to squat because that other army's not there. Because that army is not fighting for us but for the Lord. And when we get on the Lord's side instead of our own religious side There'll be Machanaim. There'll be the two armies. That's practical preaching, so I'll say amen. Preach it, Brother Thompson. Come on, preach it. All right. Uh, of course, the fine linen, it says, white horses are fine linen. And it tells us in that same chapter, in verse 8, that the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, not righteousness as in the King James. It's not righteous, it's righteous acts. Otherwise, we'd think it's talking about imputed righteousness. God will only work where there is righteous behavior, nowhere out of it. Well, we see the rest is kind of bloody and all that, and I don't want to go into that. I, my only point was to show you that the good guys are going to win. Okay, I don't care how rotten things get. The good guys are going to win. Okay, God just bides his time, laughs. But when the lion roars, things are going to happen. Now, I want you to give some thought to this fact. It is pretty common Christian understanding that the army, they don't, 
usually talk too much about two armies, but we'll just say army uh, that returns with the Lord will be an army of saints. The teaching is we'll get caught up and spend seven years at some kind of celebration, and then we're going to return in this army. Well, now, if you look at what this army is facing, and it's Christians who will be facing this, who will be coming with Jesus. It says, I saw the beast, who is anti the Antichrist world system. Is, all it is is the love of money. And the kings of the earth, power, sex, power, and money. These are the three things that drive the world. And, and their armies, and they'll probably have occult armies with them of demons, to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. And here the army is singular. Notice that. Notice that. There's a reason for that. The saints are an army of judges. The angels do the fighting. You understand that? Huh? Angels cannot judge. And saints cannot fight in the spirit world. We, we're not... Our fight is truth and holiness and righteousness. And when we're on that tack, and, and particularly obedience to God, when we're on that tack, the other army does the spiritual power. Like when we pray over the sick, for example, we can wave our arms, we can talk in tongues, we can shout, we can do as someone said, the Pentecostal rain dance. But if anything's going to happen, it's being done by spiritual forces. See? We're judges. We're making a judgment. We're binding on the earth. So I remember that. All right. So here we are down there, and we're confronted with all the forces of hell which are trying to overcome our faith. And if they overcome our faith, then the army of angels can't operate, just like today. When the devil can overcome your faith, <laughs> the angels can't operate. Because they can only operate as we have faith in God and live a holy life and a righteous life. Isn't that true? Well, you're not sure of that. Doesn't it say that if we live righteously that the devil will flee? Does it or doesn't it? Sure. Not because he's afraid of us. He's afraid of righteousness. He sees that and he says, that's God and he's out of here. He does not care anything about religion. He's only afraid of Christ and the Holy Spirit and God. That's what Satan's afraid of. And we have power only as we are in God's will doing his will. Nothing. All the rest is just religious activities. There's nothing to it. So here we are, we're facing armies of the occult, armies of witches, are, and we may face them before too long in America because the devil's trick here is to keep hidden. He may decide to come out and, and reveal himself and scare all the Christians to death. What if you wake up uh, tomorrow, uh, tonight, 2 o'clock in the morning, there's a demon sitting on your bed. What are you going to do? It's happened before to people, you know. What are you going to do? Call up the pastor. <laughs> no, we're not used to spiritual war. We talk about it. We don't have any idea what we're doing. If our eyes were open, we saw what was going on. I'll tell you, we'd run home, go in the bedroom, get under the bed, and stay there. If we could actually see what's going on. Well, this is going to happen. The church, according to Bible scholars, is going to return with Christ and face Antichrist. They're going to be facing this beast. They're going to be facing uh, the spirit of hell, Satan himself, every wicked thing, trying to uh, 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 harm their faith. You can't touch us. Just like he's done to some of us at times. Scared us to death. This is real. It's what I'm talking about. It's going to happen. Say, how soon? Well, I don't know. I don't know how soon. I told you the sequence of events that I think the Lord showed me. How long that will take? I don't know. 
I'm talking about reality. I'm not talking about a fairy story here. We've had fairy stories. We're all caught up to this wonderful gala event in heaven and everybody's happy. We, we've had enough fairy stories. This is the truth. This is what is going to happen. Well, what's the next step of logic? We have to be prepared. Does that make sense to you? If we're going to be uh, someday we're going to be riding on a white stallion and coming down from the heavens to face all the powers of hell. We're going to have to have a bit more spiritual presence than we have now. <laughs> Would you agree with that? Because if you look at that and you say, oh my, where's the pastor? <laughs> I want to go back to church and sing some more hymns. Don't worry about it. It won't happen because you won't be invited. <laughs> you, won't even, you won't get past boot camp. Now we turn to Joel. Now we're ready for Joel. Joel tells us the characteristics of those that are going to ride with Christ. Joel 2. Blow the trumpet in Miami. Blow the trumpet in San Francisco. Where are we supposed to blow the trumpet? And what does Zion represent? God's people. God's people. That's what the Lord is doing today. Speak to my church and tell them they are not ready for my coming. They're living in every kind of sin. Listen, you, you ready to hear me? I'm going to say, I've been talking, I'm going to say something. They're saying how great Jesus is, but they're not doing what he said. Oh, you're so great. I'm so thankful that you don't see my sin. It's a good thing to tell how grace, how great Christ is, and then preach what he preached. How frustrating it must be to the Lord to have people say, Oh, you're so, oh, he's so wonderful. Tell me, he's the greatest here. He's so great. He's so great. And then they go out and sin. It's vain. It goes nowhere. And the Lord doesn't like it. He said in the Great Commission, go and tell my disciples my commandments and we don't we go and talk about how great Jesus is well it sounds so right how, how can I express how great he is the answer is do what I said such a simple thing it doesn't take, you know, a great scientist to understand there's a difference between saying how great Jesus is and doing what he said. But it makes all the difference in the world. It doesn't do anybody a lick of good to say how great Jesus is if they don't do what he said. Obey his commandments. If you love me, obey my commandments. It must be so frustrating. Imagine saying to your earthly father, Oh, Dad, I love you. You're the greatest father that anybody ever had. And then you steal the keys and go out and drive his car. Now, what's your father going to think about that? Which is he going to remember? You tell him how great he is or the fact that you stole the car? <laughs> and it really doesn't take a great brain to see what's gone wrong in our country. 
And the Lord Jesus is blowing the trumpet in Zion. That isn't the lion that roared, that's me. <laughs> All right. Sound the alarm any place except on my holy hill. Don't disturb them. Let all who live in the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. We don't tremble. We want him to come. Oh, maybe I'll be raptured right this afternoon. It's enough to make a horse laugh and grow feathers. It is close at hand. What kind of a day is it? Rejoicing. Clouds and blackness. Well, that is in us, surely. Like dawn spreading across the mountains. The path of the justice is a shining light that shines more and more to the perfect day. There's a perfect day coming. And this is the dawn of it. This is the dawn of the day of the Lord. You see, in Bible terms, a day is not a day and a night. It's a night and a day. The evening and the morning were the first day. We are in the night of the day of the Lord. The day is coming. Dawn. Dawn. What are we going to see in the dawn? A large and mighty army. There's a singular. Because it's talking about the saints. Large and mighty army. Such as never was of old nor ever will be in ages to come. This army has been preparing since the days of Abel. They're up there waiting, waiting, while the foolish in the earth say there is no God. Before them, fire devours. That, that's the coming. We think, oh, these sweet Christians will come to the UN and beg for permission to have a place at the table. Oh, they're so full of love. It's just incredible. Before them, a fire of ours. I'm trying to put some balance in the Christian thinking. It isn't all love, 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 love. As some of it. God is love. God is a devouring fire. You've got to get the balance. Before them a fire devours. Behind them a flame blazes. That, this is what is going to happen in Revelation 19 when the saints descend from heaven on the white stallions of war. This is it. The land is like the Garden of Eden. Well, how can that be? What is it going to be like before sudden destruction comes? Peace and safety. When they shall say peace and safety. Now what would cause the people of the world to cry peace and safety? Have you any idea? There would be worldwide peace and safety. That's why they will say that. Under a one world government, which is shaping up rapidly, and don't fret yourself about it, it has to be. Sin has to come to a boil before God lances it. One world, cradle to grave security, everybody with a full belly. Then sudden destruction. You know, that's like that in our individual life. You've got to watch that. You know, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. Beware when everything's going well. Ask the Lord, what's the problem? <laughs> well, that didn't go over. I see that. 
<laughs> well, when we please the Lord, he makes our enemies to be at peace with us. That's very true. But I don't know about you, but I find problems every day. But praise the Lord. He solves everyone. Behind them, a desert waste. Nothing escapes them. They go through the land. They see, oh, look at this. Isn't this beautiful? Smash. Isn't that beautiful? Smash, smash, smash. Let's tear down the whole stinking thing so we can build what is righteous. Oh, yeah. There'll be no compromise. But sure, do you remember how Saul came, King Agag comes up? Oh, look at these sheepies. They're so nice. And Saul says, yeah, well, it makes no sense to kill all these sheep. What sense does that make? Well, save them, make a sacrifice. And all Samuel appears on the scene. You know, Samuel is not an elder. The, the classic battle in the Bible is between the prophets and the elders. Did you know that? And whenever the elders rule the prophets, the vision dies. There are some who say... The elders are greater than the prophets because the elders need no miracle. Rationalization. You didn't see when Jesus came to earth that the prophets rose up against him. It was the elders. So Saul spared the best of the sheep. Agag. And old Samuel comes along. Why do I hear sheep bleeding? Well, I saved the best of the sheep for my Lord. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And he hewed. The old man took a sword in both hands and hewed Agad to pieces. But Saul never got the message. And he died in battle with his son. Never could get it right. God doesn't want compromise. If you've got something in your life, it's just a little thing, you know, like a little baby alligator from Florida that you keep in your bathtub till you can't go in the bathroom anymore when it grows. That's the way it is with a little sin in your life. Oh, but it's such a little thing and everybody's doing it. But it doesn't really matter. It's such a little thing. And anyway, I can't find it in the Bible. But you don't feel right about it. Don't compromise with it. If there's, you know, there's an old commercial. They ought to run it again. It was a knockout. It was for some soap. And it was about shirts. Men's white shirts. How remember, many remember what it said? Oh, you're a bunch of youngsters. You're all under 50. Kids. It said, if it's doubtful, it's dirty. <laughs> they should have given that man a raise that came up with that one. If it's doubtful, it's dirty. So if you've got anything in your life, don't compromise. Bring it before the Lord. Say, put your fire on. I want to know. I don't think this is right. Lord, put your fire on it. Don't say, well, I wonder, you know, if I can uh, just have a little drink. What's one beer, you know? And every once in a while I swear a little, but everybody does, you know, this kind of thing. See how close to the lake of fire you can walk without toppling in. The overcomers don't talk like that. They're not trying to find out what they can do and still be an overcomer. They're trying to find out what they can get rid of. <laughs> How can I serve the Lord more? How can I be more in his presence? That's the way the overcomers talk. Not can I do this and get away with it. So examine yourself. Whether you're in the faith. All right. Now, I'm almost through here, so don't fall over. Uh, they have the appearance of horses. I find that very interesting. And I have a personal, and it isn't even a theory, it's a hypothesis. That when you have your new body, you can make it look like anything you want to. And these people choose to look like they're riding on horses. Now, that may be far-fetched. I don't know. But I go by the word appearance. It doesn't say 
they're riding on horses, like a dozen revelations. It says they have the appearance of horses. I told you once before that I saw army, uh, I saw armor, armor to put on the Lord's soldiers, and the armor was alive. Uh, well, anyway, do with that as you will. All right. They gallop along like cavalry. They gallop along like cavalry, like the charge of the light brigade. You, know, you picture the Christians today. Just, just picture the average church people sitting. Are there any ball games today that are going on? Anybody know? Are there any? If there are, you can be sure there's Christians sitting in church uh, who are listening to it on their earphone. And the pastor knows it. And he doesn't want to say anything about it. And when the big games come, the super duper bowls, super duper bowls come. There's a television out in the foyer so people can run out. Everyone's like, this is, this is the army of God. These are the people that are going to ride as cavalry. Yeah, these are the people that are going to ride as cavalry. Into the teeth of hell they're going to go with their transistor radio so they don't miss the latest game. It's a farce. Gallop along like cavalry. Do you ever read the Tennyson's Charge of the Light Brigade? Anybody in here ever read that? Have that in English or something? Yeah, Jeannie did. Well, you need to read that sometimes. Calvaries, they don't exactly kind of loiter along. Like, how are you guys doing? Well, we're here, we're supposed to fight you, but, you know, let's be friends. Anyway, don't overexert your horse. And don't go too fast. Hold back just a minute. Whoa! Don't be so anxious. That's today's cavalry. Into the valley of death rode the, what was it, 600, 500, something. All right. With a noise like that of chariots. Now, whatever you do, don't make noise in church. I was thinking of all our, all of our uh, pageantry this morning. And this is a noisy church. I don't know why the music is so loud. But I've seen people come in and cover their ears. I don't know. And I look at everybody else and they're worshiping. So I guess either you lose part of your hearing or else you get used to it. I, I don't know what it is. But, you know, let's have some nice, quiet organ music. We come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. Don't wake up the saints. A noise. I never heard a chariot, and neither did anybody in here. I've heard cars with broken mufflers. I suppose it's something like that. A noise like that of chariots. Well, I guess they made a lot of noise. They leap over the mountaintops. Well, that's what Judge was talking about. We, we, we've got to get the victory over these things. I don't be put down by them. I was thinking of an old chorus. Yeah, it was about... Uh, and, what was it? I'll think of it in a minute. All right. Like a crackling crackling fire can you picture today's charismatic people like a crackling fire can you picture it well if you can you've been places I haven't been like a mighty army drawn up for battle what is the most what is the core Essence. That's the same thing. What is the essence of an army? Discipline. No discipline, no army. The Spartans at Thermopylae, the reason that they held there was because of discipline. They'd been taught discipline so strenuously. You know what is lacking in the churches of today? Yes. It begins with a D. We have got to learn to obey Christ. I mean, he is the general. 
We've got to obey Christ in every aspect of life. Stern obedience to God. No matter what he says. I know people say, well, I'm angry with God because he did something I didn't like. I mean, you hear this incredible arrogance. What do you... What, do you know what God wants you to do? Does anybody in here know what God wants them to do? <laughs> Have you prayed long enough to find out what God wants you to do? Or are you hoping he'll bless what you want to do? Well, there's a difference, you know. This is what I'm going to do. Everybody pray that God will bless me. Yeah, if you're going to be a Christian, you have to pray and find out what God wants. And it may scare you to think about it. And you do it anyway. Yeah, but it might cost me something. Oh, yes, it may. What will it cost you if you don't do it? What's the cost of disobedience? What's the cost of carelessness? Horrible. Let's stand. I've yelled at you pretty good this morning. But I told you exactly what God told me to tell you, as nearly as I can tell. I noticed the songs this morning were right along the line of warfare. I knew God was going to have me talk on that. If you're here this morning and you're not doing what God wants you to do, will you please come up to the altar and tell the Lord you're going to do it? Discipline. You'll have to. If you're going to be in Joel's army, you're going to have to do what God tells you to do. And if you don't know what it is, keep praying until you find out. Don't make assumptions. Well, I think maybe I'm a young person, so what I'm supposed to do is fool around. Come on. Oh, hallelujah. Father, we come unto you this morning. You are God, and there is no other. And you have sent Jesus Christ, your son, and you have warned us this morning that the times are changing, that we cannot picture America of the future as we have in the past. Things are going to change. Your laws are not being kept, and the lion is going to roar. So, Lord, help us to respond as seriously and diligently that each one of us as an individual may find out what it is you want us to do as a person and do it diligently and consistently. Oh, God, we need a spirit of obedience. We need a spirit of obedience. We need to love obedience, Lord. We need to love it, love to obey God. Help us with this, Lord. We're a needy people, as was said this morning. We're a needy people. And we pray for a spirit of obedience and of repentance when it's needed. We thank you, Lord. And I still think, as I'm praying, there's people that need to come forward. And I don't want to harangue you this morning. But if you need to come forward, will you please do this until I can get relief? <sighs> Lord, they're your people. You may need to come. And if you do, will you please come?
If you would like to know more about Dr. Robert Thompson or Mount Zion Fellowship, please write to us at P.O. Box 1522, Escondido, California, 92033. Or give us a call at area code 760-747-8325. Visit us on the web at www.wor.org. Join us again next week for another program of the Word of Righteousness with Dr. Robert Thompson.